this is the transfiguration. That's what we call it because of one of the words used in the text here. It's where Jesus is transfigured or metamorphosized. He's changed somehow before the guys, before the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and his glory's revealed. And I think that this is a monumental, like epic pillar moment in the Gospel of Mark that reveals to us, among other things, the difference between Jesus's first and second coming. And I think that's like an interesting nuance that we should, we just want to observe while we're going through the text today. We're doing, this is a verse by verse study of the gospel of Mark, chapter nine, verses one through 13. This is part 30 in our methodical, long-winded series through the gospel of Mark. This is our 30th episode and we've just made it past the halfway point. So I think we're doing really good and really, we're right on pace. Uh, But we're covering, you know, theology, apologetics, and we'll be doing that today. We'll be covering theology and apologetics, both in different ways as we're going through this section. But first, let's make sure that we are getting the full context and just the text itself. So we're just going to read Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, and we'll look at this. It says, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, uh, took with him Peter, James, and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they'd seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Now, this is one of those sections in in the Gospels where I think if you just casually read it, especially not having the Jewish background, you don't live in the first century, you know, you read it and there's probably a ton of stuff you just totally miss. You know, you're like, wow, Jesus is amazing. Cool. But you don't realize there's like this whole flow of thought. There's these like really important elements that are going on here and there's a lot to unpack. And so we're going to unpack it now. Let's let's start with the part that I think trips people up and deals with apologetics. We'll start there. It's in verse 1. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So this is taken by some who I think mis- misapply the verse. It's taken by some to, to mean that Jesus was saying that his coming was going to happen within the lifetime of the people that were standing there, or at least some of them. Some of them wouldn't die of old age before Jesus came back. So that puts like a 50, 60 year, you know, time limit on the return of Christ, which means Jesus had to come in the first century. That would be the way that they take it. Um, if, If that's the case, we have one of two possible conclusions from that. Either you have something called preterism. There's different versions of preterism, but there's one version of preterism, which teaches that Jesus already came in the first century. His second coming already happened. You might have missed it, but it already happened, right? Like we didn't, most of us don't notice it, but it already happened. And it happened uh, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Not all preterists, to my knowledge, not all of them hold this view, but a certain segment of them do. Um, So preterism, it's this, it's an eschatological view. You get the point, right? That's one view. Ah, Jesus did say he was going to come back. And guess what? He came back. I think that that's incorrect. I don't think we have like good historical reasons to think that Jesus' second coming has already happened, but there are well-intentioned people who believe in God that really think that's what happened. The other alternative is what I often hear from skeptics. Jesus was supposed to come back in the first century. He didn't. There you go. Failed prophecy. Jesus was a failed prophet. He said he was coming back and he didn't, and they expected him to and he didn't. 
I think that both of these are incorrect. And I think that they're incorrect because of the context that I just read to you, right? We do read in verse one, Jesus does say, some are standing there with him right at the moment who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. How do I see that this has already taken place? Well, it takes place in the next verse. Verse two, it says six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. There's some of those who were alive today who were standing there with him. And he brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. They see Jesus in his glory. They see Moses, they see Elijah, they see the kingdom of God coming with power. But only some of them. It's fulfilled right there on the spot. Now you might, as I first was giving this answer to this question, because someone challenged me this, so I opened the gospel and I'm reading, and I'm like, what is, does context help me understand what Jesus means here in this verse? My, thought, my next thought was, okay, but what about the parallel passages? What about the other places where, G, where this same statement from Jesus happens? Because it happens three times in three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have Jesus saying, there's some of you alive right now who will not die until you see the kingdom of God come in power. Well, it turns out in all three Gospels, it's the same. Jesus says it, and the very next thing that happens is the transfiguration. Let me read to you uh, Matthew 16, verse 28 through 17, 2. It says, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days later, <laughs> there it is again, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led him up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. So we have, again, immediately after the, the statement, some of you will not die, he then has those guys experience that. In Luke 9, verses 27 through 29, here's the third time it happens, third passage is recorded in. It says, but I say to you, truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. So my point here is that the transfiguration of Jesus and seeing Moses and Elijah with him, this is these seeing the kingdom of God come in power. Now there's more nuance to this, which is why you're like, but wait a minute, weren't they expecting it to be like this worldwide thing? Yes, but that's where we get into the idea that Jesus is showing us the difference between his first and second coming in this passage. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but first let me handle another apologetic issue, which is that if, if some of you might've noticed it, right? Uh, two of the gospels said it six days later, Peter, James, and John, they go up to the mountain. One of the gospels says, some eight days later. Right, that's Luke. Luke says, some eight days later. And uh, I, I like the, I like, I'm like smiling while I'm talking about a supposed contradiction. Because I've already studied it and I have an answer for you and that excites me to be able to bring answers to these troubles uh, that some people will struggle with. Um, so in Matthew and Mark, it's very specific, six days later. It's just six days later. It's, it's not a, a generic number of time. There's no qualifier. It's just six days later. Luke, however, gives a more generic term. It says some eight days later. You notice how it said some? Well, that is actually a Greek word, Jose, that means about. You're like, Jose, that's me. No, not. not, that's not he's not even here tonight, actually. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Um, but, uh, but no, that's the word, Jose. And it's, it's a word that means about or approximately. So in Luke's own statement, he's like approximately about eight days later about eight days later. So it's a, it's a generic term. Now I want to give you more support for this. Um, this word Jose is used by Luke more than the other authors. In fact, more than any author in the New Testament. He just likes approximating things. It's like what he does. He's like about, it, it's like when you say like, 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 try it. Once you start thinking about saying like, it's like you say it more because you like can't stop because it's like coming out all the time. Anyhow, Matthew uses the word three times. Mark only uses it once. In John, we don't find it at all. In the Gospel of Luke, we find it nine times. We find it nine times. In the entire New Testament, outside of Luke Acts, we see it a total of six times. So it's not super common of a word. But in Luke and Acts, which are the books that Luke wrote, we see it a total of 17 times. Luke likes to say approximately. It's just like his thing. He just likes to say this. In Luke 3.23, he says Jesus was Jose. 30 years of age, or he was about 30 years of age. He doesn't mean exactly 30, he means about. In Luke 9, 14, he says, there were about 5,000 men, of those who were fed, the feeding of the 5,000. 
there were approximately 5,000 men. Here he says some or approximately about eight days later. Um, so anyways, there's no, there's no actual conflict there. Now there's another possible thing that's going on here, which is that Luke might be rounding up because he's considering um, the day Jesus made the statement and the day that it happened. And it's possible that Mark and Matthew are only counting the days between. So there's another answer there that could explain both. Um, you know, he says it, you know, in the middle of the day, one day, it happens in the middle of the day on the, on the last day. Do we count those days or not when we say six days later? This is, this was us in staff meetings at Hosanna. This is like, this is, we spent half our staff meeting being like, wait, do you mean two days after or two days, like 48 hours after? Or, I mean, we would spend copious amounts of time discussing what we meant by the next Wednesday, is that this coming Wednesday or the, the next Wednesday that happens? Or is it the next Wednesday, like next week's Wednesday? Like which Wednesday are we talking about? So anyway, I can understand how these sorts of things come up. Um, now what's interesting though about the time, the time indicators in the Mark, Matthew, and Luke passages is that every one of them, after Jesus makes the statement, they're all careful to tell you it's some specific amount of time and then they go up on the mountain. What, is this, what does this do, these time indicators? It ties the two things together. Now, Mark in particular rarely does this. He just says like, then this happened. He doesn't generally say six days later, three days later, the next day this happened. That's sort of a rare thing in the gospel of Mark. The point here is Mark is connecting the transfiguration to the statement of Jesus that some will not die until they have seen the kingdom. I think we have three gospels, we have time indicators, we have good reason to think that the transfiguration is the fulfillment of Jesus' statement earlier in uh, Mark 9.1. Deliberate connection. Now there's more evidence to support this as well, because why not? <laughs> so first Peter talks about this, or excuse me, second Peter. Second Peter 1 verses 16 through 18, Peter seems to be talking about the transfiguration on the mount. So it's Peter's later commentary on what he saw on the mountain, it's kind of cool. It says, we did not follow uh, cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, not just of him, but of his majesty. For when, the, when he received honor and glory from the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter's saying, we were eyewitnesses of this moment where Jesus' glory was revealed. He wasn't just veiled with his flesh, like his glory hidden from us. It was revealed to us. We heard God himself speak. And so he's, uh, he's now using the, the multiple eyewitness testimony of the glory of Christ in his letter as he writes to them. This was definitely the transfiguration we can see from 2 Peter 1, 18. It was when we were with them on the holy mountain. And how it functions in Peter's argument through his book is real interesting. In 2 Peter, he's basically saying, Jesus is going to come. It's guaranteed because of the things that have already happened, but he's coming at his own timing. Don't stress it. Like he's gonna come whenever he wants. This is where later on he says like for a day is as a thousand years with the Lord, which I don't think is a math problem for us to figure out. I think the point is God's timing is God's timing. It's not on your schedule, but he's for sure coming. And that's the point. Um, how interesting that in a book where he's saying, don't worry about the timing, it's just for sure he's coming. He relates this to the passage where Jesus talks about some will not die till they've seen the kingdom come. In other words, here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Peter sees the, um, the revelation of Jesus on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration. He sees this as a sample of Jesus's second coming. He sees this as like a guarantee. See, it's really gonna happen, here's a preview. Now I can wait on the Lord until it's really fulfilled because there is a difference between Jesus's first and second coming. I hope you're seeing how the theology comes together. That's kind of the point. That's what we're getting at. Um, notice also, if, if you're there in 2 Peter, he mentions that what they saw was the power and coming. They're made known the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting in Mark 9, 1, Jesus says that those who will see, what they'll see on the mount is the power of, uh, the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So he's talking about the coming of Christ with power and the kingdom of God having come with power. The two passages are connected. That's the idea. So some would say, well, this is confusing. This is confusing. Um, why have it happened in such a confusing way? 
why, why have Jesus say something that's, that seems like it would stumble some of the audience? Some of you guys are going to see the kingdom of God and then a, a very select few see three people and they're told, don't tell anyone. Boy, that's confusing. And I think it's to draw out the fact of confusion about Jesus's first and second coming. I think that that might be the goal here. It's exactly the difference between the first and second coming that Mark is focused on in Mark 8 and Mark 9 that Jesus is communicating to us. When you understand the difference, you understand Jesus and his purpose. In Mark 8, we see the cross, right? The Son of Man has to be re- rejected, will be, um, will be killed, and will rise again. He's going to die for us, this unexpected reality. Then in Mark 9, we have um, this picture of what his second coming will look like. It's like a sample, but only some of those standing there will witness it. Notice that some of you will not die. What's the implication about the rest of them? You're not going to see it. You're going to die before you see the kingdom of God come. So I think this is, this is to give us the difference between Jesus' first and second coming. Again, this was the Jewish expectation that they were going to happen at the same time, that they were just, there was only one. Really, in a sense, they had no room for the first coming. They just expected the second. And so what Christ is giving them is the explanation of the first coming. All right, here we are in verse 2. Let's examine this transfiguration a bit more, see what we can learn from it. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. These are like the inner circle, the three. Peter, James, and I, there was, there was, there was like 70 disciples. There was, then there was just the 12, the 12. Then there was three amongst the 12, Peter, James, and John. They occasionally get pulled aside for special things, special tasks, special revelation, that kind of thing. And he brings them up. It says on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Okay, let's talk about the nature of Jesus' change. What is going on with Jesus right here? Um, the word is transfigured. Um, it's, 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 well, it's metamorpho. It's like the word we get metamorphosis from in our English, although English words don't mean necessarily what the Greek words mean and all that, but that is the word we get it from. The idea here, though, is that there's like an external tr- transformation, external change. His appearance has changed before them. And I think what's happening, it seems clear, is the deity of Christ is shining forth. Jesus is more than a man, more than a messenger. He's more than Moses. He's more than Elijah, right? It is, it is his deity that's shining forth. And the goal here is that they might be eyewitnesses of his majesty. God wants to make sure Peter, James, and John, they understand the glory that Christ has. Because up till now, they've been wondering, like, who is this who calms the storm? Who is this who says he can forgive sins and then does it? Commands out massive amounts of demons. Who is this? Who is this? And then now, it's like they're getting something of an answer as they see the glory of Christ shine forth. In a sense, <clears throat> Jesus, when he comes uh, on the earth in human form, he's like the high priest on the Day of Atonement. In the Old Testament, this high priest on the Day of Atonement would set aside all of his high priestly garments. He normally looked glorious. In fact, the high priest, the coloring and the, and the, the things that he was wearing, he looked on the outside the way the temple looked on the inside glorious, the same colorings, the same kind of things on him as was in the temple. So he looked like heaven on the outside. And he would go in and he would see heaven on the inside, so to speak. The rest people see kind of the ugly covering of the temple. But on the day of atonement, the high priest took off all his garments and he was just clad in plain old white clothing. He looked so normal. And it was there that he made offerings and sacrifices for the sin of the people. And Jesus, he comes setting aside his glory, setting aside the, the, the I mean, what, what he would look like fully revealed in his glory. He comes in human form. He comes setting that aside. He does his work of atonement for us. And then he takes up his glory afterwards. Well, the Mount of Transfiguration is like a little glimpse into, into who this person really is. That's what the idea is here. Verse 3, it says, His garments became radiant. And the idea of radiant there, it means that they were shining. So not reflecting light, but they're like creating their own light. And exceedingly white, as no launderer on the earth can whiten them. What is this about launderers? What is the point about launderers, right? Uh, In different translations, handle this different. Well, the ESV, I think it says that it's like whiter than anyone could bleach them. Um, And the the idea is that it's just getting that point across. Um, I don't know if they used bleach back then or not, but that's probably a fair translation, I think, so we, we understand it in our current language. The point about launderers is this, is you can't naturally get clothing to look like this. That's the whole point. So Jesus, his clothing is supernaturally radiant. It's glory. The thing that's making it shine is not bleach. 
right? It's glory. It's shining, radiant. No lauder on earth can do this because it's a supernatural appearance uh, of glory. Remember this point because we will come back to this a little bit later. The next thing that happens is Moses and Elijah show up. Moses and Elijah. Um, this is kind of a big deal, right? This isn't like a normal thing, like Moses and Elijah just show up long after, uh, long after the fact. This doesn't really happen. The return of these guys is the kingdom of God coming in power in a sense, right? Moses and Elijah show up. I wonder what they were expecting at that moment. I wonder if the disciples thought, it's on, right? Yes, it's happening. We've been waiting for this. They thought this was probably going to be a long-term thing. In fact, we'll see from Peter that he probably did think it was going to be a long-term thing. But they show up and then they talk with Jesus. And I was wondering to myself, I wonder what they talked about. I wonder what they talked about. What, what, if you could just listen in on the discussion. Well, they did. And they wrote about it. Luke 9.31, it says, Who appeared in glory, ap- appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So they talked to Jesus about his death. That's interesting. I wonder if they were learning about it. I wonder if he was telling them what he was going to do. I wonder what the discussion was about. I wonder if Moses and Elijah were like, oh, this, is, this was the plan. Because they had written about it, but they didn't fully understand it. They, written, they wrote as inspired, but only God really knew how all the puzzle pieces would fit together. So I wonder, perhaps, if they were learning about it. But the focus of the conversation is his departure, his death. Interesting that later Peter uses that same term departure to talk about his own death uh, in 2 Peter. Elijah and Moses um, both have interesting stories in the Old Testament. They both almost saw God on a mountain. Isn't that interesting? They both almost saw God on a mountain. Let's briefly look at that. Exodus 33 is where we read about Moses, how he almost saw God on a mountain. Verse 18 Exodus 33, 18 says, Then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. He asks God to reveal his glory to him. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Long story short, he sees a partial revelation of God. God's like, I'll show you myself, but not like this full revelation of all that I am. You can't do it. You can't see it. Perhaps because it would kill him. I mean, that may be the reality of it is that it would bring him into judgment. Um, There's other theological reasons though, I think why that also happened, but... Um, <clears throat> now, in Matthew, the parallel story of the, of the transfiguration, it adds something. It says in Matthew 17, 2, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light, which means they were seeing his face. Jesus is God with us, and here on the mountain of transfiguration, Moses gets to see what he asked to see on the other mountain, which was Horeb or Sinai. What he didn't get to see while receiving the law, he get, did get to see in Christ. That's pretty cool. Elijah has a, a, a different experience, but also on the same mountain as Moses. In 1 Kings 19, he travels to, to the same Mount Sinai, same location. And there he is. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, there's a fire, there's a wind, there's all these things, but God's not in them, right? And God speaks to him in a still, small voice, but he doesn't see the Lord. It's not a visual, it's just the auditory experience on that same location. But now both Moses and Elijah have finally seen Jesus and his face. And I I think that there's a picture here in which we see through the whole Old Testament that we're getting uh, teachings about Christ, but the full revelation of God is in Christ. It's going to be in Christ. It's going to be when we see him and we see him not there on uh, the mountain where the law is brought, but over here as as he's heading more towards the cross. Now, both Moses and Elijah also have something else in common. They have unique endings. Unique endings. Elijah, it seems, didn't even die. Um, He was just taken away. He was just taken away. Well, Moses, he did die. But we have this interesting phrase in Deuteronomy that says that God buried him. God? Like it wasn't humans. God did it. Right? And then we have, we have in the New Testament speaking about there being some dispute, some angelic dispute over the body of Moses. 
So this is interesting. This is very interesting. Well, here we have two guys who had like these sort of strange endings, and then here they are, come back with Jesus on the mountain. There's more about Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses may well represent the law and the prophets. Um, with Moses, this is easy. Moses represents the law. I mean, this is what the Jews would call the law. They would call it Moses, right? It's written in Moses. Moses said, and they, were, and they don't really mean to identify it as it being Moses on his authority, but the law was so connected to Moses as he brought it to them that they just called it Moses or the law of Moses. That's right. I'm saying Moses so many times it's starting to not mean anything to my head right now, right? Moses supposes it's toes a roses. But um, anyway, so Moses is, is definitely connected to the law. We see that for sure. Elijah, he's not a law guy. He's a prophet. And Elijah may represent all of the prophets. That's entirely possible. Elijah was the prophet who was expected to come back at the end time, right? Uh, Jesus, while he connected John the Baptist to the ministry of Elijah, he said that all the prophets prophesied until John the Baptist, like there was a culmination. And he identifies John the Baptist as coming in the spirit of Elijah. So there's, the culmination of prophecy is somehow represented by Elijah as well. So what we see with Elijah and Moses is the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, they're standing, talking with Jesus. But Jesus is better than both. That is a main point in this, in this transfiguration you might miss reading through casually. Jesus is better than Elijah and Moses. He's, he outshines them, literally, in this, in this passage. Uh, Moses, in fact, if we read about Moses, Moses shined too. Did you, do you remember this? He, he had a shining face as well in the Old Testament. In Exodus 34, we read about it. But notice, notice that as we read, he didn't shine like his own shine. It wasn't coming from him. It was a reflection of something else. Here it is, Exodus 34, verse 29. And it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin on his face shone because he, of uh, his speaking with him or his speaking with God. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, beheld the skin of his, uh, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. And they were scared. It's understandable. Uh, they thought he was radioactive. No, they, they, they just, they know that you can't come near God in all of his glory. And here he comes and he's shining and we're scared. And we don't know what to do. Then verse 31, then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Paul uses this picture in the New Testament. And he says, you know, notice Moses spoke to them. I call them near. He's like, don't worry, come near. They come back near. He gives, them, he gives them the word of God. But then he puts the veil over his face. And Paul says this was so they wouldn't see that it was fading. That the shining of his face was fading away. He spoke to them while shining, but it was, it was just a reflection having been in God's presence. This is different with Jesus, though. Now, Paul, just so you know, um, and most of you are familiar with it, but Paul, he uses this to say, just as the law has a fading glory, yet Jesus has a constant glory. Well, what we see is this transfiguration passage is connected to this. Because just as Moses, he reflected God's glory, Jesus produces his own. That's that word radiant. His face was radiant. It was shining forth. He was not reflecting anything. Jesus didn't go and talk with God for a while and then come back with a glowing face. He's transfigured before them and out of himself is shining in glory. Matthew 17, 2 said his face shone like the sun. So in that, Jesus is better than both. Um, so the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, they point to Christ, they lead to Christ, but Jesus outshines them. Jesus is better than them. Jesus is more important than them. This is deep theological stuff to a first century Jew. We uh, do well to recognize how like pivotal it is, even though we've become very used to the idea that everything kind of points to Christ. But it's nice to, to, to just freshly appreciate it. Verse 5 here in uh, Mark 9, here's Peter's response to all this. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he didn't know what to answer, for they became terrified. I just, I just like how Peter, just, he was I don't know. What, so he's, he's trying to think like, how do I help? What can I do? You know, and so he's like, I'll make some tabernacles, one for each of you. Now, Luke adds one more thing to this that gives us a little insight. In Luke 9.33, it tells us what was going on when Peter said this. In Luke 9.33, it says, 
And as these were leaving him, that's Moses and Elijah, they were leaving, they were visibly departing from Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was speaking. I think the context of Luke gives us more insight into Peter. Peter sees Moses and Elijah, they start to depart from Christ, like they're leaving. And he's like, no, don't leave. I want you to stay. So he's going to build them tabernacles so that they have somewhere to stay. He wants to make this temporary visit permanent because Peter, like the Jews of his time, sees only one coming. Not the Messiah dying for our sins, but him coming in glory to take over the world. That's where I see, there's so much about the first and second coming in Mark 8 and Mark 9. And it's like this pivotal moment in the gospel of Mark where we see the difference between Jesus' first and second coming. He only saw one coming. He wanted them to stick around. But they're leaving. Why are they leaving? Because it's not time. Because the time is for Christ to die, to be rejected. That's what they even talked about. How he'll be rejected, how he'll die for us. Jesus, before he comes to take over the world, he comes to save the world. He comes to die for my sin, to die for your sin, to pay the price for all the wicked things we've done. This is kind of important. Or else he would come and establish a kingdom with no citizens. Because none of us are worthy of God's kingdom. We need to be washed, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So their job, Moses and Elijah, their job is to deliver you to Jesus. Is to point you to Jesus. Is to say, look, it's all about Jesus. It's all getting you and your eyes on Christ so that you could see he is the one who outshines all of us. He outshines us all. Later, the apostles did this without Moses and Elijah present, but they did this. In the book of Acts, they constantly preached that Jesus was the Messiah, and they used the law and the prophets to do it, Moses and Elijah, right? They used the law and the prophets to point people to Christ, but the, the idea is that you're not, okay, now come under obedience to the Old Testament law. It's like, no, 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 see how it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's the message. So... The, the big picture we get here, I think, is that the time for the kingdom of Christ has not yet come. This is a sample to teach us some lessons about Jesus and his kingdom that only a select few, Peter, James, and John, were able to witness to teach them lessons. It wasn't about arriving in the kingdom. It was about teaching them lessons about the kingdom. <laughs> then they leave. And Jesus is also about to depart, isn't he? He's also going to leave, which gives us the necessity of the second coming. We need the second coming, if for no other reason than that Jesus left. <laughs> He's to come back and establish his kingdom. Mark 8.31 made this clear. In chapter 8 of Mark, the whole chapter made it clear. But it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So that the, the death and resurrection is central in the mission of Christ. Mark 8.38, he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. What words would they be ashamed of? The words of his crucifixion and resurrection. The idea that it's not just about coming to reign, it's about dying for our sins. So I think what we're getting in Mark 8 and 9 is the gospel of, of the sacrifice of Christ. That context is being slammed into the idea of the Messiah. The first and second coming confusion is being exposed and being dealt with in Mark 8 and 9 so that we can have a proper understanding of Jesus. Now, there's plenty of people today who think that this is all later inventions of guys like Paul. And that's why a careful study of Mark is important so that you see in the Gospels, not just Mark, but across the Gospels, we see it's the same message. It's the same thing carried in different ways. All right, verse 7. Verse 7. It says, then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Now, in context, God never said that about Moses. He never said that about Elijah. Now, he did say, listen, you better listen to Moses, right? But he didn't call him this, his beloved son. He's saying that Jesus stands head and shoulders above the others. He is the ultimate uh, messenger of God because he's God himself come to speak to us. He says, listen to him. That's, that's it. This is the whole message, right? See this guy? He's my son. You better listen. And I think that when we encounter the words of Jesus, we encounter something that raises our accountability really high. Like, we better listen to the words of Jesus. We better, you know, listen to the things that Christ himself has said because it's God himself. It's God himself. And how we treat what Jesus says is how we're re reacting, responding to God. 
In Acts 3.22, uh, Peter takes a hold of this idea and he connects it to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, um, there was going to be a prophet like Moses who would rise up. And we've talked about this, I think, not too long ago in this, in this service. So I won't get into the details. But this prophet like Moses is Jesus, and we're to listen to him. The same thing that uh, God said about Jesus on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration. So Acts 3.22 uses that phrase as well, listen to him. It says, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. This is the whole message is you better listen to Jesus. The idea is this, is that not only was this prophet, this is kind of cool, not only was the prophet going to show up and in, in, in prophet like Moses show up and do something amazing, he was going to show up with new information and you better believe it. And so Jesus comes and he's bringing the, full, the fullness of the gospel in his life and you better receive it, you better believe it. It's not enough for you to sit on what you've known in the past, you need to respond to Jesus. His words are scripture, in other words. Uh, verse 8, as we read on, <clears throat> it says, All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. So this, to me, seems as though the, the, this whole thing was choreographed because we find out in Luke that Moses and Elijah start departing from Jesus, like they're taking their time, like they're starting to leave. And Peter's like, hey, wait, no, no, we'll make tabernacles. And the cloud comes, God speaks, and they're gone like that. Meaning that there wasn't like this traveling that had to happen. It was... It was choreographed to teach us things. God's drawing these events out to teach us lessons. So no one's with them except Jesus. Here's the conclusion. Jesus is glorious. Listen to him. Jesus is the ultimate message from God. Listen to him. That's the bottom line. This is a peek at Jesus' glory. Greater than anyone who's ever come before or since. Greater than Moses. Greater than Elijah. I, I want you to imagine their awe. They're like, looking at Jesus on the mountain, shining in his glory, and they're thinking, this is the same Jesus that was asleep in the boat. This is the same Jesus that I just, I'm, I see so often, you know, that like I know his facial expressions, that like I know, you know, when he has bedhead, which there was no cure for in the first century. <laughs> Everyone had bedhead at all times, pretty sure. Is that true? Don't Google it. There's, the, the thing is that they would see Jesus lowly and meek and suddenly they have this revelation of his glory and they're like, and I wonder what it was like for them after that. I wonder how they felt. The intimacy and the love and the friendship of Christ along with his incredible intense glory and to see both of these things. And there's a good lesson for us in this too that we don't forget the glory of Christ. We don't ever think that Jesus is mundane it's always been like a little pet peeve of mine. And I don't mean this, you know, pet peeves are my own issue, right? A pet peeve is when you have an issue and you blame everyone else for it. That's kind of what a pet peeve is. So I don't mean to blame anybody, but it's always been something that gets to me is when I hear people um, say Jesus as though his name has no value. Or they talk about Jesus as though in their head, the version of Jesus is just the, the felt board, you know, or like the cartoon. That's Jesus. And I, and I think we need the revelation that Jesus is, is that Mount of Transfiguration in his glory, coming in his kingdom with the power of God, with all accountability for listening to the words he says. Jesus is God with us, and that should cause us a sense of healthy fear, a sense of honor, a sense of awe uh, and praise. It should, it should cause our worship to just explode. But this moment is a handoff. They see no one around them but Jesus. So Moses and Elijah, you don't need them. You need Jesus right now. Now you still need Moses and Elijah to point you to Christ, but you need to listen to Christ. Verse 9. <clears throat> As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they'd seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. Can you imagine having that experience? And then Jesus is like, don't tell anyone. That would be a little tough. I can't tell anyone. So when the Pharisees come and they're like, I'll prove to us who you are. I can't be like, dude, trust me. He's legit. Like, stop irking him. You know, it's not going to go good for you. Listen to him. He's the, he's the son of God. I, you know, I don't say anything. Don't tell anyone. Knowing what it meant, knowing what it revealed about Christ, but not knowing, not being able to tell anyone. I do think the disciples spent a good amount of time being confused um, I think that was on purpose. I think that sometimes bouts of long-term of confusion can sometimes be the only thing that finally gets us to clarity. But they had to just kind of hang on to it till one day it all clicked and they saw there were two comings of Christ. 
There was him coming to die for us and him coming to establish his kingdom. Hebrews 9.28 talks about the two comings of Christ. It says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, his first coming, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. He's going to come and establish his kingdom. Then in uh, verse 10, it says, They seized upon that statement. What statement? He says, Until the Son of Man rose, f- rises from the dead. You, you can tell people what you saw, but after I rise from the dead. So they seize upon that statement, discussing with one another, what rising from the dead meant. What could rising from the dead possibly mean? Sometimes we struggle to understand the obvious because we have preconceived notions that the obvious isn't true. Right? Like that the simple, plain, literal meaning of rising from the dead wouldn't, couldn't be true. He's not going to really die. Like this has to be a metaphor. It's got to be another parable. I think that this is a growing issue. Um, in our modern times, and that there are, I mean, there's times where the the Bible speaks symbolically, there's times where it speaks literally, but there are also times where people don't like what it says, literally, and so they want to turn it into some sort of vague symbolism. So, um, let's see, Bishop uh, Spong, have you guys heard of him? He says that when the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead, that the resurrection of Jesus is a metaphor. He would have been with the disciples here what does he really mean rises from the dead? It's a, and it's a metaphor. Now, Spong is quick to get irritated at people who say that metaphor means it's less than if it really happened physically. Metaphor is more. Metaphor is even greater than a real physical resurrection. To me, this is nonsense. <laughs> I'm like, hey, guess what? You know, your, your mom got in a car accident, but she's okay. Metaphorically. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, I wonder, can I have her really be okay? No, metaphorical is even better than her being okay, really physically. Like this is this is nonsense to most of us, but it's like a weird rescue device for the fact that his view is vacant of the truth of Christ. It misses out on the resurrection. Um, so what we need to do is let the real death and real physical resurrection of Jesus be the thing that we really believe. This is this is Christian truth. Uh, it doesn't need to be turned into a metaphor. We have to resist the temptation to reinvent Christianity to fit people's expectations. Verse 11 says, they asked him saying, why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And the question I have as I read verse 11 is, why are they asking this now of all things? Uh, You know, they're puzzling. What does he mean rise from the dead? And the next question, why does Elijah come first? In fact, why do the scribes say Elijah will come first? So this could potentially be that they're trying to counter Jesus who says that he's going to die and rise. And they're like, but wait, in the prophecy, Elijah comes and he restores all things. If Elijah is going to restore all things, then you're not going to be rejected because everyone will be ready for you because Elijah is going to prepare the way for the Lord. So maybe this is a way of saying, see, here's a way you don't have to die. Like the kingdom is going to come right now. One coming, not two. That might be a reason. Um, Or perhaps they're wondering if Elijah's coming is an accurate expectation given that Elijah just showed up and then took off again. Is Elijah coming or like, how does this work? So they're, they're, um, they're, they're confused. Jesus answers, verse 12, and he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Now the tense there is interesting. He, it sounds like it's something that's going to happen in the future, right? Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? The confusion is like, yes, Elijah's going to restore all things, but guess what? The Son of Man's still going to be suffer, going to suffer and be treated with contempt. Don't think Elijah trumps the need for the death of Christ. That's what he seems to be saying here. But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. So Elijah does come first and restore all things. First thing is, it affirms that that expectation is biblical. It is true. This is actually based on Malachi. We read this last week. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the lamb with a curse. There will be a restoration and it will avert painful judgment. But then he asks a question to teach them. How is it written the Son of Man will, uh, that, that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Interestingly enough, this is Jesus probably referring to Isaiah 53. It's important that Jesus himself refers to Isaiah 53 because he, his own self-understanding of the Messiah is that he's going to suffer and die. That's important. Um, 
The next question is, how on earth did Elijah already come then? You confused? It, it's, it's healthy. It's okay. You'd be a little confused. The disciples were confused. How did Elijah already come? And Jesus explains he came in the purpose, in the person of John. John wasn't literally Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So not the liter- literal Elijah was on the mountain with him just a minute ago. But John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, scripture says. And he says in verse 13, they did to him whatever they wished. Meaning that it, in a sense he came, but he didn't restore all things. That is a future event. At least that's my understanding of the eschatology is that in the second coming of Christ, there is Elijah comes, restores all things. That's the thing they're talking about. He's talking about his first coming where he, along with Elijah, ends up being rejected ultimately. So he came, but he didn't restore all things yet. How do I make sense of all this? Again, Jesus has two comings. And Elijah, in the same sense as Jesus has two comings, Elijah, in a sense, has two as well. That would be my interpretation, my understanding. I think it's, I think it's true. The first time, it's John in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he's ignored and killed. He's a forerunner of Jesus' suffering and death. Just like Jesus will suffer and die, John suffered and died. The second time around, Elijah shows up. We read about this in the book of Revelation, I believe. Elijah shows up, and this time it is bringing revival, this great Jewish revival, and the way is prepared, and they do receive the Messiah just as many Jews will come to the Lord uh, in that time. So I think that that's, I think that that's right. Now, I do want to have proper humility because when it comes to eschatology, it's probably one of the toughest areas of scripture to really get everything right. And godly men have never made bigger fools of themselves than when they try to make predictions based on what they thought about the text, usually because they thought everything was supposed to happen in their lifetime. I mean, pick a generation. They always think it has to happen within 20 years. Always. 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010, 2020, and it's going to ramp up because we're hitting exactly 2,000 years from the life of Christ real soon here. And I just know it's just going to ramp up even more. My thought is no one knows the day or the hour. Put your calculator away. Wait on the Lord. Um, But there's my view of the eschatology of it. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding something. I think Elijah has two comings. I think that's the point of Jesus in this passage is that the first time he was rejected, just like Jesus is to be rejected. He actually says, just as it is written of him about, about Elijah, <clears throat> Elijah's, excuse me, some sort of frog that jumped into my throat, an actual frog. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let's read it again in verse 13. It says, but I say to you that Elijah indeed has come. That's John the Baptist. There's no dispute about that. Definitely talking about John. And they did to him whatever they wished. Okay, they killed him. They cut off his head, right? Herod did it. Just as it is written of him. Where's the prophecy about Elijah being killed at at, at a first coming? Where is this? Well, in a sense, it's just typology. I don't think it's a direct prophecy. I think it's the typology is written of him. Elijah When he first showed up in the Old Testament, Elijah comes and Jezebel is trying to kill him and the people of Israel are rejecting him as as they're rejecting God and they're worshiping false prophets and he ends up being chased. I mean, the, the giant victory on Mount Carmel, the response from the king, from his wife who's really running the country, she says, you're gonna die by tomorrow. That's not not what he was expecting. So what we see is he was recognized by the leaders as a legitimate prophet, but he was rejected anyways, Elijah. Recognized but rejected. John the Baptist, same thing. Recognized but rejected. So I think that this is a typological fulfillment that Jesus is talking about. Um, And finally, in closing, so only got about 30 minutes left. No, we're closing. There's two applications I want to give you guys. One is... um, that just as the nuances, and though they were confused about it, the nuances that there was a first and second coming of Christ, even though they didn't understand how all those puzzle pieces came together, they were literally going to be fulfilled. And we too need to have confidence and trust in the fact that God is going to do what he said he would do, that Jesus, as he came, he will come back. And our confidence needs to be in his return, even though I have no idea when that's going to happen. And those who say they have an idea of when it's going to happen, chances are they said it was going to happen 20 years ago, and they said it was going to happen 50 years ago, and they said it was going to happen 100 years ago. Because we just think everything will happen in my lifetime because my timeline for God to work is from the time I'm born until the time I die. So we assume everything's going to happen there. It's just kind of like, I think we just make mistakes when we do that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have great confidence that it will happen in his own time. 
All scripture will be fulfilled. It's coming. It's glorious. And it's worth waiting for. And the kingdom of God will last forever. And we will be part of it. And it's worth it. The next application is that we have to realize the gravity and the wonder of the glory of Christ. Sometimes we see Jesus as though he is not clothed with his glory. And it's just healthy for us to recognize in our prayer when we approach God that we approach God Almighty. Then we pray in the name of Christ that I am in him, full of glory and majesty, the name above all names, the name every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess the lordship of Christ. We should appreciate him. We should appreciate the cross. And appreciating the cross, this might, this might help you next time you think and meditate on the cross. Is know this that when the disciples saw Jesus on the cross, they would have these three guys would have known what they had seen on the mountain. That him shining in his own glory, the ultimate messenger of God, he was on the cross, dying, and that would have made little sense to them at the time, but shortly thereafter it would have clicked. That's what he gave for me. That's what he suffered for me to be forgiven. And all, the, all I want to do is invoke our appreciation and our love and our worshipfulness to our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice and love of Jesus Christ. The power and the glory and the majesty of Christ, clothed in human flesh, come humbly and lowly a servant. Revealed as just in a glimpse on this Mount of Transfiguration, but... But Lord, we pray that we would, we would have that glimpse ourselves and that we would see you are, you are he who shines in his own glory and that when we say Jesus, it is the most awe-inspiring name there is, the name above all names. Fill us with wonder, appreciation, gratitude, Lord, for your goodness and your love. We thank you, God. We thank you for your humility and for your glory. Let us take neither for granted. We worship you. We bless your name. We appreciate your sacrifice. That the blood that you spilled for us was, was your blood, was the blood of the glorious one for the, for the life of sinners. We're so grateful, God. Let us rest in you and have peace in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't even mention it, but there's another interesting thought, which is that Moses, when he died because of his failures, he wasn't allowed to see the promised land or to be in it. He could see it from afar. But now that he's standing there with Jesus, where is he? Yeah, in the he's in the mountaintop in the promised land. And so in a sense, it's like where I, I should have mentioned, there's always things I should mention in studies, but I should have mentioned it. The, the beautiful thing though, is that Moses, who couldn't enter because of sin, mm -hmm. when he's with Jesus, he can enter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful picture itself of the gospel. Yeah.